out there and um, um, welcome everybody. It's, um, uh, I think we're gonna have an interesting presentation tonight. We're really fortunate to have um, Robert McMaster here. He's a, written a biography about Edward Hitchcock, um, who was, uh, as the poster said, America's first dinosaur expert. Um, um, so he'll be talking about the, the life and legacy of Edward Hitchcock. Um, and also about work he's done with a geological survey in Vermont a little bit later on. Um, the book that he's written is called All the Light, All the Light Here Comes from Above, <laughs> and it's the life and leg legacy of Edward Hitchcock. Um, you can um, ask questions, but if you can save them to, to toward the end, you can either um, speak up or put them in chat. And I know Robert is uh, very willing to help out and answer any questions people have. And we will be recording this session so that we can put it on the Shalott Library website. Um, so I will let the program begin. And thank you so much for coming and doing this for us. Okay, my pleasure. Uh, let me just share here. Thanks so much, Jenny, and everybody at the uh, Charlotte, Charlotte Public Library for helping to make this event possible. And um, thanks to all of you who are tuned in from wherever you are. Um, thanks for joining us uh, this evening. Um, the, uh, in the year 1800, uh, American geology was still in its infancy. Uh, up until that time, the field had been dominated by a group of Europeans, uh, most of whom who had never even been to North America. But in the early part of the 19th century, um, uh, a, a first generation of truly American geologists began to emerge, and many of them were from New England. One of them, you may recognize the name, Zadok Thompson, was a Vermonter, um, studied at UVM, um, went in one of the first classes to graduate from that university. Um, and um, another one was uh, this man, um, James, um, um, James, it's hidden on my screen there and I'm, I'm, uh, uh, blanking off, oh, James Dwight Dana, who was a uh, uh, native of New York, but he spent his whole career in paleont mostly in paleontology at Yale. Um, and lest you think it was an exclusively male-dominated discipline, uh, Frances Bascom was born and raised in Williamstown, Massachusetts, although she went on to do most of her research in the Midwest. And then there's this man, Edward Hitchcock, poet, uh, playwright, preacher, professor, paleontologist, and college president. He was easily one of the most influential um, scientists of his time, both in uh, North America and in Europe. And so I was quite surprised when I was working on another project some uh, 10 years ago to discover that uh, no uh, biography had ever been published for Edward Hitchcock. And so in 2017, I began my uh, research and my book, as uh, Jenny mentioned, All the Light Here Comes from Above, The Life and Legacy of Edward Hitchcock was published in 2021. Um, um, what I'll do tonight is I'll give you a rough timeline of Edward Hitchcock's life um, with special em emphasis on his influence on geology and paleontology, and also his interest in Vermont. And most of his work, his most important work in Vermont, occurred late in his life. So don't be impatient. I'm going to get to it, but it'll be in the last half of my talk, although there'll be several references to it earlier. Um, Edward was born in Deerfield, Massachusetts in 1793. He was born in this house. If you've been to old Deerfield, you probably walked right past the house. It's still standing and in very good condition. Um, he and his four siblings all attended Deerfield Academy, which was within sight of the house. And in fact, um, his oldest brother uh, attended the very first class to graduate from the academy in 1799. Edward attended Deerfield for parts of six years. 
from 1804 to 1809. And amazingly, those six years were the full extent of his formal education. Pretty astounding when you consider what he achieved in his life. So he left Deerfield Academy in 1809, but in 1816, he came back, not as a student, but as the headmaster. That's a pretty meteoric rise, isn't it? Um, they called him preceptor. He was the teacher of the male students at Deerfield Academy. And this young woman, Ora White, was the preceptress, the uh, teacher of the female students. She had already been there several years when he arrived. Um, because Deerfield was a very progressive educational institution for its time, it believed in the equal education of young men and young women, but not in the same room at the same time, heaven forbid. And so Edward and Aura became friends, they became co-workers, and they became much more than that, as you'll see shortly. Aura was very well uh, educated. She was from Amherst. She was very well educated and, and uh, skilled in math and science and what they called the decorative arts at her time. She was also a devout Calvinist, um, what they called the Orthodox Christian at the time. Um, and that's roughly equivalent to Christian fundamentalism as we know it today, emphasizing the personal relationship between a believer and his God, repentance for one's sins, and renewal of one's heart in order to achieve salvation. And she succeeded in converting Edward to Calvinism. He grew up in Deerfield, which was strongly Unitarian. And she can, so that's quite a change from Unitarianism to Calvinism. <laughs> and um, she uh, succeeded in converting him. And that faith would be central to the lives of both of them for the, from then on. While Edward was at Deerfield, he published his first major scientific paper. And here it is. It was in the New American Journal of Science. And it was entitled Remarks on the Geology and Mineralogy of a Section of Massachusetts on Connecticut River with a part of New Hampshire and Vermont. Um, so it was a uh, the first most detailed uh, geological study of any part of the United States at that time. It included this map that you can see on the right here, drawn by Aura. She did thousands of drawings, and I'm not exaggerating when I say thousands of drawings and illustrations for his published works and for other purposes during uh, her lifetime. Um, and But if you look carefully, you'll notice that that map uh, extends from um, through central Western Massachusetts up over the Vermont line. There's Halifax, Guilford, Vernon, Brattleboro, and Marlboro. That was it as far as this paper was concerned and this map is concerned. So it only touched on the extreme Southern Vermont, but it was still a very important paper in Ed Edward's career. For one thing, early on in that paper, he observed this about the Connecticut River. He said, um, in the town of Gill, there is a cataract in Connecticut River from 30 to 40 feet in height, and it is believed that the alluvial region and part of the secondary shown on the map from this fall to the place where the river passes between Mount Holyoke and Tom was formerly the bed of the lake. That was the, he, he was the first geologist, first scientist, so far as we know, to recognize that there was a enormous lake in the Connecticut Valley here. And uh, we know today that it extended as far north as St. Johnsbury and as far south as Hartford. And it became known many years later as Glacial Lake Hitchcock. Um, he didn't call it a glacial lake because neither he nor any geologist at his time was thinking about glaciers in North America. It just was not a part of the North American geology so far as they could tell. But we know today that that is a giant glacial Lake was. Well, Edward's um, tenure at um, um, Deerfield lasted only about two years. He uh, was discharged in the fall of 1818 um, when he, uh, because the, not for any shortcoming on his part, but because the academy was falling on difficult times, there was a national recession and so on. Um, and so he, um, 
left. Um, oh, I, one other thing I meant to mention going back to that paper was because of that paper and several other things that he did, he was awarded a ma honorary master's degree from Yale, which may help to explain why the following spring after he was discharged from Deerfield, he traveled to New Haven and for about seven weeks attended classes by Professor Benjamin Silliman and Eliezer Fitch. Now he was not a, an enrolled student. He was what we might call an auditor nowadays. Um, so he just sat in on their classes, but these men had an enormous influence on Edward Hitchcock throughout his life, particularly Benjamin Silliman. He and Edward Hitchcock became very good friends. Um, and Silliman was a chemist and a geologist. Eliezer Fitch was a theologian. Um, at the end of that seven weeks, this was in June of 1819, he was invited, Edward Hitchcock was invited to preach a sermon at the West Haven uh, Congregational Church, and uh, the first sermon he ever preached. And I think this quote from his private notes about that event are rather hilarious, as you'll see what I mean. He wrote, felt, whoops, sorry, he wrote, sorry, back up here. Uh, there we go. He wrote, felt much solicitude, diffidence, and weakness in this first effort in the pulpit, but have much reason to be grateful that utterance was given me. I feel fearful that my lungs never will permit me to preach long should I live to complete my studies, but with God, all things are possible. Let me be humble. Let me be watchful. Well, I find that hilarious because it, this was the first of over a thousand sermons that he would preach in his lifetime, and a lack of utterance was never a problem for Edward Hitchcock. Well, he came back to... Um, uh, Deerfield uh, with a new voice and a new vocation. He was now Edward Hitchcock, itinerant preacher. And there he goes on his horse and buggy up and down the Connecticut Valley, filling in for ministers who were pastors who were absent on a Sunday um, from a, a, for two years, from June 1819 to June 1821. He was a busy guy in those two years. He delivered, uh, he wrote 37 different sermons and he delivered them 108 times. Sometimes uh, many visit, visiting many uh, churches again and again. For instance, five times in Longmeadow, six times in Springfield, nine times in Deerfield, 15 times in Brattleboro, although they had at least two parishes and he visited both, and 30 times in Conway, Massachusetts. Conway is a small town. Why so many sermons in Conway? The answer is that the pastor in the Conway church, John Emerson, was almost 70 years old and in failing health. And so he called upon Edward Hitchcock to preach there again and again over those two years, 30 times that we know of in all. And it's not surprising that in May of 1821, when uh, Reverend Emerson announced that he was partially retiring, Edward Hitchcock got the call. Um, and so um, just a few days after he got that call, he and Oro were married in uh, Amherst, as you can see from that uh, little newspaper item there, very brief. Um, and they traveled the 10 miles or so to Conway and set up housekeeping, housekeeping in a house that still stands in Conway, Massachusetts. Um, he was... Um, um, a well-liked preacher, um, but it seems clear that his scientific interests in that period outweighed his theological interest. I say that because he published five articles in religious publications in the four years that he was in Conway, five religious articles. He wrote 20 scientific articles. So you get the feeling that he his interests were divided, um, his sense of maybe loyalty were divided while there. Um, he did publish another major scientific work in that same journal, the American Journal of Science, uh, editor Benjamin Silliman, by the way, um, entitled uh, Geology, Mineralogy, Topography, a sketch of the geology, mineralogy, and scenery of the regions continuous to the Connecticut 
river. So the same topic, but an expanded scope over that pre previous uh, paper. And this time he went much further into Vermont. As you can see, there's the Vermont state line. He went way up through Vernon and uh, Putney and Westminster up to Rockingham. And the paper covers uh, so maybe the southern third or fourth of uh, Vermont. The um, In March of 24th, 1824, Edward Hitchcock stood up before his congregation. He'd been there now three years. Um, and it must have stunned his congregation what he had to say, because he was not in the habit of introducing personal matters into his sermons. But on that day, he stood up and at, in the middle of a discourse on the sovereignty of God, um, he said the following, Thus far I had preceded my hearers in the composition of this discourse when I was called away to witness in the prostrated agonies and final removal of an only child, a painful exhibition of the sovereign dominion of Jehovah. That child was their first child, a boy named Edward. He died just under the age of two and he was buried in Conway. We know all this because Amherst College has an enormous collection of his unpublished uh, materials, including over 200 sermons and hundreds and hundreds of pages of his lecture notes and private notes and so on. Without them, I could not have done this project. But later in that sermon, he said something else, which I think is one of the most riveting and uh, 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 things in all of his sermons that I read. He said to his congregation about the death of their son, if there is one feeling within us, meaning him and Aura, stronger than the rest, it is a sense that we deserve that punishment. And it lends smarting poignancy to the wound to know that the arrow which has pierced us passed first through the heart of our child. It's hard to imagine a heavier burden laid upon grieving parents than the belief that somehow they had lost that child because of their own sins. But that was the nature of Edward and Ora Hitchcock's faith. Well, about a year and a half later, October of 1825, Edward resigned his uh, pastorate in Conway. Why did he resign? Well, he told the congregation the reason was poor health. Um, but I think it had to do in part with the death of little Edward, that it probably made life in Conway painful for them, although they had another child on that on the way by that time. But also, I think, has to do with his um, um, split loyalties between his ministry and his science. And thirdly, he was offered a um, faculty position at Amherst College. Um, now, Amherst College uh, at that time was only four years old. It opened in 1821, and it was founded for the express purpose of training young men for the Christian ministry. That was the original uh, mission of Amherst College. So you can imagine why Edward Hitchcock might have thought this would be a favorable uh, position for him, because he could pursue his science, but also continue to pursue his ministry. And he continued to preach. He taught Bible studies um, and um, uh, throughout his career at Amherst College. He was at Amherst almost 40 years. And as you can see, he taught chemistry, mineralogy, geology, natural history, botany, and Bible studies. Geology was his first love, and he taught geology every single year of his tenure at Amherst, 37 years, and that included the four years, uh, no, excuse me, the nine years of his presidency. He never failed to teach that course, and he finished that course in December of 1863, and he died about four months later. Well, starting in 1829, Edward recorded what he called his private notes. They weren't exactly a diary um, because the, they were um, certainly not everyday entries. They were uh, only occasional entries, and sometimes there were big gaps between them, but often those entries were very long. And they had to do with his spiritual life. They had to do with his uh, professional uh, scientific life and a little bit to do with his family and a lot to do with his own personal worries and concerns. Almost every entry refers to his failing health 
and many of them predict he's predicting his own death. So in 1833, he wrote, if his providence does not save me, I shall soon be in my grave. In 1834, he wrote, perhaps my present state of health is only a short respite from the grave. In 1847, while he was president of Amherst College, he wrote, the college will rise and flourish, but I must die soon. And in 1859, he wrote, the probability is faint of my seeing another year, and I long to be prepared to go. Um, you might think, it's clearly Hitchcock was consumed, you might say even obsessed with his own death. And you might think that such a fixation on one's impending doom would have had a depressing effect, that it would make made it very difficult for him to get out of bed each day to carry on in life. But that's not the way it worked with Edward Hitchcock. <laughs> the very opposite. It seems he used this belief in his impending death as an incentive, as a motivation to get busy, to teach, to preach, to do the work that he believed God had sent him to do. Far from depressing him, his desponding nature, as he called it, served as a powerful motivator to get on with life, to complete projects, even at times to take on big new projects. And in 1830, one such very big new project came came to hand. Uh, he'd written a letter to the then governor of Massachusetts, Levi Lincoln, suggesting a geological survey of Massachusetts. And Lincoln liked the idea, sent it to the legislature. This would never happen today. A month later, Hitchcock had his appointment as the first um, uh, state geologist of Massachusetts. And he set out just about a month later on his first foray on a horse-drawn wagon, um, around Massachusetts to uh, at the beginning of his geological survey. In that one um, summer, he um, traveled 50, or a year, because it went into the fall too. He traveled 56 days, 1,600 miles, and visited 158 towns. And that pace was continued for the next three years, um, 31, 32, and 33. By the end, he'd traveled 135 days in total, over 3,000 miles, visiting 266 cities and towns in Massachusetts and some adjoining states as well. And we'll talk about his uh, time in Vermont then in a moment. One of his goals was to draw a precise geological map for Massachusetts, which he did in that first report, and Ora drew it actually and colored it, as you can see here. It was probably the most detailed geological map ever drawn for any state. I'm pretty certain it was um, at that time. One of his, another of his goals was economic. The legislature wanted him to identify resources that would be potentially valuable to the state and to the citizenry. Um, and I think on balance, that part of his survey was not all that fruitful. Why do I say that? Well, the two biggest resources in the state, mineral resources in the state at the time, were limestone to the west and granite to the east. Well, those resources were already being widely exploited and extracted in 1830. So Edward Hitchcock, while he talked a lot about them, couldn't take much credit for their, for their development. Um, and he seemed to get fixated on some other resources that, well, let's just say they never really panned out. For example, in his final report in 1833, he wrote the anthracite of Rhode Island and even that of Worcester, Massachusetts, will be considered by posterity, if not by the present generation, as a treasure of great value. Well, I think it's safe to say that nobody ever made a dollar mining coal in Massachusetts or Rhode Island. There's coal down there, but it's inferior quality, and it was never able to compete with coal from other parts of the country. Um, he also wrote about gold. He said, the gold which we got from six quarts of dirt in Somerset, Vermont, weighs seven grains, and the large pieces from the brook, 29 grains. How far south the gold may be found remains to be shown. May we not expect to find it near the Holly, Massachusetts mine of iron, since this is in the same kind of rock? Well, I've spent some time in Holly, and I can tell you there was never a gold rush in Holly, Massachusetts, or anywhere in Massachusetts. Now, as you may know, there was a gold rush in Vermont, and I will come and I'll come back to that in a few minutes. 
But Edward Hitchcock's geological survey was very, very important as a model for other states. In fact, after he started his Massachusetts survey, you can see there were something like 17 other states that followed suit. And many of them explicitly used Hitchcock's model of his survey and of his reports um, in their surveys. I have added Vermont at the bottom there with a series of dates in red, which will be explained in, in a few moments. Um, and as you can see here, um, uh, George Perkins Merrill of the National Museum of Natural History in Washington, D.C., many years later, said of Hitchcock's uh, report, it marked an epoch in American geological work. Okay, well, um, another um, important effect or result of Edward Hitchcock's geological survey had to do with um, the Great Flood. Because um, <clears throat> at that time, um, he, like most scientists, um, saw much of the surface geology of the Earth as diluvial, that is, as caused by water erosion. And that water would have come from a flood, the great flood of the book of Genesis, Noah's flood. Um, but two phenomena in particular struck his interest throughout Massachusetts and elsewhere in New England. Diluvial grooves, as he called them, we'd call them glacial striae today, and um, uh, boulders, large boulders, rounded boulders, uh, carried far from their source. We'd call them glacial erratics today. He was particularly interested in those boulders and did uh, talked about them at great length. One of them he found or visited in Whitingham, Vermont. He called it the Green Mountain Giant because he believed it was the biggest glacial, not glacial, excuse me, biggest boulder of its type in Vermont. Um, there are some larger ones in um, Smuggler's Notch you may be familiar with, but those are not of the same type. And I'll explain a little bit later. Um, and I can attest to how big the Green Mountain Giant is because there I am standing in front of it just uh, two years ago. <laughs> and it is a monster. <laughs> um, and it's in public land in Whitingham. And if you go to my webpage, you can actually find out exactly where it is. Um, he also named a, a, a rock a boulder in Massachusetts, the Vermonter. There it is there on the right. Um, he called it the Vermont. It was in it is in Florida, Massachusetts, which if you know Western Mass, Florida is up close to the Vermont line near North Adams. So he called it the Vermonter because he was convinced that it originated in Vermont. And I visited that as well on the same day. You can see the <laughs> dressed in the same clothes. Um, and it's very easy to get into that too, right off of the Mohawk Trail in uh, Florida. Um, so, and, and again and again, he saw trains of boulders like that one that you see on the left there. This is in a paper he did in 1847, describing a tr train of hundreds, maybe thousands of boulders, all of the same rock type, carried from a mountaintop in New York State across Berkshire County, some 15 or 20 miles, um, up and over and uh, uh, intervening ridges. And in looking at that, he just could not imagine how any flood could have caused such a phenomenon. And he wrote back in 1833 in that report on his geological survey of Massachusetts, making every allowance for the reduction of the gravity of these boulders when in water. I confess, I cannot conceive how such a work could have been effected by this agency, this agency being water. Well, in 1837 or 1838, this man, Louis Agassiz, published a work on the um, his landmark study of continental glaciation. Um, he stole some of that material, I think, from others. He's often gotten credit for it, but there were others that deserve credit for that as well. But as soon as Edward Hitchcock read Agassiz's work, it was like an, an epiphany for him, <laughs> to use a biblical term, um, because now suddenly all of this evidence of these boulders and of those um, furrows in the rock started to make sense. And Edward Hitchcock stood up before the American Association of Geologists in Philadelphia in 1841 and wholeheartedly embraced Agassiz's theory. And I believe he was the first American scientist to do that. <laughs> 
Of course, Edward Hitchcock is best known for his study of what he called the fossil footmarks of the Connecticut Valley. Um, in 1835, he was contacted by Dr. James Dean of Greenfield about several slabs of sandstone that had been removed from a quarry in Turner's Falls near Greenfield, Mass. The slabs exhibited what appeared to Dean to be the tracks of birds. Hitchcock traveled to Greenfield and confirmed Dean's suspicions. They were, he concluded, the tracks of birds or bird-like creatures. He concluded that on at least three bases. One, they were all three-toed, like most birds. They were digitigrade, meaning they walked on their toes, unlike, say, mammals that walk on our, the soles of our feet. And they were bipedal, meaning they walked on two feet. On that basis, he concluded that they were bird or bird-like creatures. Well, this, um, and he published a paper on this in the, um, again, in the American Journal of Science in 1836, description of the foot marks of birds or ornithic on new red sandstone in Massachusetts. Um, it was, um, uh, very controversial in, uh, oh, after, after, um, I should say that after, Dean showed him that sample. Hitchcock started traveling up and down the Connecticut River Valley looking for more tracks. He found at least 15 localities with very, very similar tracks or, or, um, of uh, what he thought were bird or bird-like creatures. Notice they stop at Gill, Massachusetts. There's no evidence of any of them in Vermont or New Hampshire. And that's because this rock formation that they all occur in, red sandstone, ends at Gill. Um, but I'll come back to that point in a little while. Um, and his, his conclusion was these were the tracks of ancient birds. Now, this was fairly controversial at the time. You might say it ruffled a few feathers. Uh, first of all, uh, because it, um, these birds would have occurred in ancient sandstone, suggesting that they were present on Earth hundreds of millions of years earlier than paleontologists had previously believed. So that was one piece of controversy. But even more strikingly, as you probably know, some of these tracks were enormous, upwards of 18 inches long, even bigger than the track of an ostrich. Now that these were the tracks of ancient animals was largely accepted by the scientific community within a few years and scientists came and looked at them themselves and they agreed. His Hitchcock's avian hypothesis that these were the tracks of bird or bird-like creatures was a little bit harder sell, but within a few years, most scientists agreed that they were the tracks of birds or bird-like creatures. The popular press was not convinced and Hitchcock took a lot of ridicule uh, in the popular press for this notion of these giant ancient birds. Um, and even into the 20th century, people said, how unfortunate that Edward Hitchcock insisted on his avian hypothesis. Well, I think that's wrong. I don't think he insisted on it at all. He favored it, absolutely, but he didn't insist on it. What he insisted on um, was that this was open to debate. In a speech in 1843, he uh, said that there may have been animals in the red sandstone period of a different class, say reptiles, with feet so exactly like our present birds as some of the tracks on stone seem to be, it is easy to imagine. So he was leaping the door wide open. And in his major opus, his major published work on the fossil footmarks in 1858, it was called Ichnology of New England. Ichnology was a term that he coined because this was a totally new discipline that he'd invented. Um, he said, he wrote, I speak of those animals as certainly birds, though doubts sometimes cross one's mind on this point. And I am aware that with some distinguished zoologists, these doubts are strong, but I follow what seems to me at present the most probable view. A lot of scientists late even into the 20th century sa said, why didn't Hitchcock recognize that these were the tracks of dinosaurs? Well, for one very good reason. <laughs> the word dinosaur hadn't even been coined in 1835 when Edward Hitchcock first observed those tracks in Turner's Falls. And when it was coined in 1841 by Sir Richard Owen in uh, England, uh, it was used to describe some creatures found in the fossil record in Europe, 
who could not possibly have been Hitchcock's track makers, right? They're all wrong. They're four-footed, they're plantigrade, right? <laughs> like us, and the number of toes is all wrong. So there's no way that Edward Hitchcock could ever have looked at those and said, ah, these are my track makers. Well, of course, our view of dinosaurs in the late 20th century changed dramatically. And today we know that dinosaurs are relatives of ancient birds, the uh, descendants of ancient birds. In other words, as Martin Lockley wrote in 1991, Hitchcock was right all along. The tracks were indeed those of special types of birds, not creatures identical to, to modern birds like the turkey, but their ancient theropod ancestors. The theropods were the one group of dinosaurs that believe, they believe gave rise to birds. There are other groups of dinosaurs as well that are more closely associated, for instance, with reptiles. And Robert Baker, who is probably the most uh, eminent, eminent um, American dinosaur expert, had, wrote in 2005 that Hitchcock was the earliest and in many ways the best mind in dinosaur science. He wrote, all of us 21st century students of the dinosaur bird relations owe a tip of the hat toward the Reverend Edward Hitchcock. So Edward Hitchcock's reputation was uh, resurrected, you might say. During those years when he was uh, studying the fossil footmarks, he accumulated thousands of track specimens. And he, during his presidency, he had this building, the Appleton Cabinet, constructed to house that collection. It still stands today. It's a dormitory. Um, but if you want to see Hitchcock's collection, this is the place for you. The Bonesky Museum of Natural History at Amherst College. It is fabulous. And so it's not called the Hitchcock Museum of Natural History because Hitchcock didn't give $5 million for it, but that's okay. I'm sure that would be all right with Edward because it shows off Edward's um, collections beautifully. Um, and it's a wonderful monument to the man. It's free, uh, it's open uh, uh, a lot. So if you're at all interested in Hitchcock or in paleontology or in dinosaurs, this is a great place to spend a few hours. One of the frustrations for Edward Hitchcock was that the, um, um, with all of those footprints that he found in a uh, rock, uh, there was a complete, nearly complete absence of skeletal remains. How could it be that there were that many of these creatures around and they left so few bones? Well, about a half a century after his death in 1910, this woman, Mignon Talbot at Mount Holyoke College was walking near the college and came across this spectacular um, fossil, um, which came to be known as Podocosaurus holyokensis. And it actually turns out to be one of Hitchcock's track makers. Um, it's also distinct, it has a new status in Massachusetts because in la last October, I believe it was, uh, Governor Baker signed a proclamation making Podocosaurus holiocensis uh, our state dinosaur. And wouldn't uh, Edward Hitchcock have loved to see that occasion? Also recently, uh, this man, a professor at Mount Holyoke, Mark McMenamin, found a piece of a dinosaur femur, um, or is it humerus? I guess humerus, um, in Amherst at a construction site. Um, and um, it's called, it's, they believe that it's related to this creature from Antarctica. Um, but it gives us hope that there's more um, skeletal remains to be found around New England, and that could include in Vermont. You're not likely to find uh, dinosaur tracks like we have them in Connecticut, Massachusetts, but you could very well find skeletal remains, particularly in the Connecticut River Valley, where these two, uh, Professor Talbot's and Professor McMenamin's uh, specimens were discovered. Well, in 1844, the fortunes of Amherst College had hit an all-time low, and they turned to Edward Hitchcock and asked him to take on the presidency. Uh, he was convinced that he would be a poor candidate for it, but he could not say no. And he believed that God had called him to this position. For one thing, he didn't like to ask for money. And how good of a college president can you be if you don't like to ask for money? But almost from the day that he took over the presidency, the fortunes of Amherst College 
turned around, not because Edward Hitchcock was a good fundraiser or anything like that, but because people trusted him, people believed in him. Um, the following year, he traveled up to uh, Middlebury and received another honorary degree, this one, uh, Doctor of Divinity from Middlebury College. Um, and you can see there that he got that uh, um, honorary master's degree from Yale in 1818, as I mentioned. He also got an LLD degree from Harvard in 1840. So six years of uh, what would be high school education, and he got three uh, uh, honorary degrees. Um, he served as president for nine years. During his tenure, uh, enrollment doubled and the debt was retired. Four professorships were added. Three new buildings were constructed. And most importantly, harmony was restored within the college. And the college historian wrote some years later, the value of Dr. Hitchcock's presidency to the institution cannot be overestimated. His weight of character and his wise policy saved the college. And by the way, Edward Hitchcock was also instrumental in the establishment of Mount Holyoke College and in the University of Massachusetts. So come 1857, um, Edward Hitchcock is retired, and by rights, he should have been just staying at home enjoying his grandchildren, but not Edward Hitchcock. And his health was, was failing too, um, because Governor uh, Ryland Fletcher of Vermont uh, wrote him and asked him to become the uh, state geologist of Vermont and to carry out a geological survey of Vermont. This would have been a massive undertaking for a man of 67 years of age. Vermont, almost as big as Massachusetts and far ruggeder uh, in terrain. Um, well, maybe uh, fortunate or not, he had to turn it down. He accepted the appointment and then days later had to turn it down when he was uh, appointed president of Amherst College and he could not say no to Amherst College. Uh, so he turned down the governor of Vermont and the position was given over to Charles B. Adams, who was one of his colleagues at Amherst College. And Charles was a very, very fine geologist. He spent seven years um, at this geological survey that I'll talk more about in a few minutes. Um, and collected thousands of specimens, made thousands of pages of notes, and then died. Um, Zadok Thompson, who we mentioned before, took over and spent three years working very hard at the Vermont Geological Survey, and then he died. You can see a pattern here. And in 1857, uh, the collections that Charles Adams had collected and housed in the State House in Vermont in Montpelier were destroyed in that fire that burned that damaged badly damaged the State House. So it seemed like the Vermont Geological Survey was not meant to be. Augustus Young was a state legislature and a naturalist who was appointed, and he wasn't in it but six or eight months and he died. So you know Edward Hitchcock was not a fool. <laughs> he could see the handwriting on the wall, but he accepted the post because of that really innate ambition and drive that he had, even in spite of his infirmities. And at the end of his first year in the geological survey, he wrote this amusing paragraph to Governor uh, Fletcher. He wrote, the history of the geological survey of Vermont is a melancholy one. Since it has commenced 12 years ago, no less than three distinguished naturalists who have had charge of it have been called into eternity. And when I find myself in advanced life and full of infirmities occupying their place, is it superstition or is it reasonable apprehension that makes me sometimes feel that a fourth individual may have the same summons before the survey is completed? So he was thinking he was seeing the handwriting on the wall. But wisely, uh, Edward Hitchcock uh, selected three younger men to assist him. His two sons, Edward Jr. and Charles, were both by then young adults. And Albert Hager, who was a native Vermonter, I think he was a born in Bridgewater, um, and eventually went on to be state geologist after Edward Hitchcock, um, and he knew Vermont very well. And the plan was that the Hitchcock would travel, uh, do the survey with, um, with these three men and take some of the pressure off of him. Um, 
Well, they their plan was to, this is a geological map from that um, survey, an incredibly uh, beautiful and very, very detailed map, uh, much more so than the Massachusetts map that he did some 30 years earlier. Um, and I've written, drawn in those red lines are the 13 transects that they intended to follow uh, and collect specimens and gather data uh, from south to north across the state. Um, <laughs> And they were in the first transect there, <laughs> just north of the of Vermont line, when things started to go awry. And I'll tell you about that in a minute. They drew transects, uh, they drew cross sections for each of these. And I've reproduced the one here that might interest you the most because it goes from Mount Washington. Uh, I can't see it. There it is. Mount Washington in Vermont, uh, in New Hampshire on the right, all the way to Charlotte. And this is, the resolution isn't great here, but perhaps you can see uh, Charlotte there in Hinesburg and Huntington and uh, Duxbury. So he did incredible uh, detailed maps, he and the others, uh, for this uh, 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 survey. But on May 24th, during that very first transect, um, he um, ran into trouble um, with his health. Um, and let's see if I missed something. This is my, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, he, they set out in early May and were at work on their first transect when Edward took sick. And he made this notation in those private notes of his from May 24th, 1857. He wrote, this is my 64th birthday. And though everything around me is bursting into life at this delightful vernal season, yet it becomes me to turn my thoughts forward to death and eternity, especially as the present state of my health reads to me an impressive lecture on my frailty and liability to be suddenly removed. In consequence of an extremely hard journey in Vermont and exposure to storms, I have developed a new, a difficulty in my heart, of which I have formally spoken in this journal yeah, many times. <laughs> So he returned to Amherst exhausted and sick, but his three assistants continued to wor work for the next three years. They traveled all those 13 transects. They collected volumes of data Edward Se and three, over 3,000 rock and mineral specimens. Edward Sr. remained in Amherst, busying himself with several other huge projects. Um, but when the time came to produce a report, he worked long and hard on it, taking the work of his sons and Mr. Hager and combining it with his own insights. In many ways, this was the capstone of Edward Hitchcock's geological career. Uh, this was the uh, combination of all of that he learned throughout his life, even about glacial geology, because by now, the theory of uh, uh, continental glaciation was pretty well accepted and about metamorphism, about the um, uh, terracing, river terracing, like you see in these maps here. Uh, he put it all together in this report. It was massive. It is massive. Two volumes, 982 pages, 364 illustrations, 38 hand-colored plates, five hand-colored folded maps. Beautiful work. Very, very impressive work. And Albert Hager, I think, gets a lot of the credit for seeing this through to publication in Vermont. They, it included hundreds of fossils. Their collections included hundreds of fossils. No dinosaur footprints, alas, but hundreds of fossils. One of them I wanted to draw your attention to because you might recognize it. It's the one at the bottom there. It's known as the Charlotte Beluga Whale. Does everybody know about this? It's the official marine fossil of Vermont. And it was discovered in Charlotte by Zadok Thompson, who you've heard me mention before, in 1849. And it was then reconstructed and donated to the state by Albert Hager in 1861. I understand that the reconstruction is flawed uh, based on what we know today about the, the uh, anatomy of a beluga whale. Um, but um, they decided to leave it in Hager's configuration as a piece of, of geological or paleontological history. And you can still see this at the Perkins Museum at UVM. Well, when I was a little boy um, growing up in Massachusetts, one of our favorite family destinations was the Calvin Coolidge State Park in Plymouth, where we would camp for a week in the summer. I bet some of you know what I'm talking about. And one day my father took us on a hike in the southern part of that park where we followed a stream that my dad said was once panned for gold. 
Well, I remember being a little doubtful of that. It didn't look any different from any other stream I'd ever seen. But here is a map from Hitchcock's survey. There's Plymouth Notch, you know, the Coolidge birthplace and so on. Plymouth State Park is up in here. And those gold lines there refer to the streams uh, in that area where gold was found. So my dad was right. He wasn't telling me a lie. There was indeed a gold rush of sorts in Vermont beginning in about 1851. Gold was discovered in Plymouth and in Bridgewater and in some other places as well, although it never got to be enough to attract too much investment. Um, and uh, I think that's a scene of um, an operation in uh, Plymouth. Um, so no, gold was never, there was never a big uh, uh, find of gold, never enough to justify continuing it. And I think the operation was abandoned after several decades. Edward Hitchcock's greatest ambition in life was to convince his fellow scientists, clergymen, and the general public that science and faith need not be antagonistic, that science should not be regarded as the enemy of religion. He wrote several dozens of scholarly papers on that subject, and in 1851, he published this book, Religion of Geology, which he believed was his most important work of his lifetime. Um, and in it, he tried to demonstrate the unity of all knowledge and asserted again and again that the hostility between science and revelation is only apparent, not real, when rightly interpreted and understood science and religion will be in perfect unison. That was his mantra. That was his belief. Um, and he had a number of ways that he reconciled them. But in general, he believed that science would eventually um, uh, prove the Bible to be true. Uh, although the Bible was subject to ample interpretation. Just as an example, when it said that the heaven and earth were built in six days, were created in six days, he said, well, the Hebrew word for day doesn't mean 24 hours. It means uh, any length of time. Some, some, somewhat like we use the word day, in your day, meaning in your time, that kind of general use of the word day. And if that's the case, then the Bible could have said that it took billions of years for the earth to be to be created. So anyway, he was convinced that there was not a conflict between science and religion. Of course, that whole conflict came to a head just a few years later in 1859, when this man, Charles Darwin, uh, published on the origin of species. Um, at first, Edward Hitchcock argued strenuously against Darwinism, both on scientific and on religious um, basis. But if you read his papers carefully in the last few years of Hitchcock's life, you see his thinking about Darwinism beginning to pivot, beginning to change. In a very important paper he published just a year before his death, he wrote, the real question is not whether these hypotheses, that is, Darwinism, accord with our religious views, but whether they are true. And later in that same work, he wrote, um, the fact that these new creations are repeated at intervals and seem to form a part of a series of operations which we know to be natural, makes it quite probable that they also are natural. Perhaps this unknown law will by and by be discovered, as many new laws have been explained to explain, uh, have been to explain phenomena once supposed to be miraculous because anomalous. Um, and so that's uh, uh, how he ended his career, was leaving the door open, um, uh, keeping his mind open on the subject of evolution. Possibly, just possibly, he postulated the transmutation of species, natural selection, even human evolution were all part of God's plan. Now, some historians have labeled Edward Hitchcock as the last of the Christian geologists, but if they mean by that term that he was someone who allowed religion to intrude upon and influence the science, I think they've got it all wrong. Um, for Hitchcock found his own way of bridging science and religion. Um, far from being the last of a dying breed, he might well have been one of the first of a new breed of scientists who were comfortable with a world created by God, but regulated by the laws of and principles of nature.
There's a story told by one of Hitchcock's students that late in life when he was starting a new term with one of his geology classes, the class met for the first time in a renovated building with a skylight that brought in light into the room that had previously been entirely dark. And on the first day, Professor Hitchcock stood before his students, looking up at the light streaming into the room, smiled and said the following, which I think is a perfect summary of the fundamental principle of his life. Young gentlemen, all the light we have here comes from above. Okay, well, I will leave it there, except to remind you that uh, I have a web page, uh, www.hitchcock.com, that I invite you to, to visit, especially the Hitchcockiana uh, section here, uh, There's uh, which I update regularly. There's a story in there about those giant boulders, including the locations, if you're interested. You might get a kick out of my meeting with this these two uh, bright young folks here, Emily and Sawyer Hitchcock. They are the great, 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 great grandchildren of Edward Hitchcock. And we had a fascinating discussion about their famous grand great-grandparents um, one day at Smith College. Um, you'll also find more detail on the Vermont Geological Survey in this post that I just put up a few days ago called Against the Odds, Edward Hitchcock and the Vermont Geological Survey. And I have a series of YouTube videos all you have to do is put in Edward Hitchcock or put in my name in YouTube and you'll see five or six uh, videos. Um, they're 15 minutes. One of them is just four minutes in introduction. The others are 15 minutes or so long. Um, again, my book is the, All the Light Here Comes From Above, The Life and Legacy of Edward Hitchcock. It's available in paperback and in several different ebook formats. I know the... Um, um, uh, Charlotte Library has a copy, and there are several other copies in Vermont libraries at the moment. You can get them, get the book as well from any of the major online retailers, but I always urge my readers to go to your local independent bookstore and give them a chance to get it, because they probably won't have it on the shelf, but they can get it if, they, if you ask. Um, I've also written a series of historical novels set in Western Massachusetts called the Trolley Days series. That's from the World War I era. And my newest endeavor is a series set in modern day Ireland, the first of which just came out this spring, and that's called Rose of Glen Carey. So um, here's a list of uh, some of the organizations that uh, uh, made this all possible, and I'm really very grateful to them. And I also use some of the illustrations from the Vermont Geological Survey in this PowerPoint uh, tonight. So I will leave it there and be very happy to hear your thoughts or your comments. Um, so uh, fire away. <laughs> Not all at once. Bob? Bob? Yeah. Can you hear me? This I can is hear you. Richard Tonino. Yeah. I, I went to Amherst and then I was a professor at UVM for years. Uh -huh. So I'm pretty familiar with all that you showed, and I really appreciate it. Great. Uh, we, we were told when we were there that he was the father of dinosaurs. And uh, it, it is not, not true, but, you know, it, yeah. it was pretty close in the museum. My question is this. Was there any connection uh, in any way between uh, Edward Hitchcock and William Smith, the fellow who basically was doing much of the same stuff stuff, founded fossils, and countered the religious beliefs in seven, I, I believe uh, he was a, a canal digger in England who did what was known as the map that changed the world uh, by Simon uh, Mc, uh, Winchester. Yeah. And he was 1793 in England. And I wonder if there was any connection because it's quite analogous. He was born in 1793? Uh, I'm not sure if that's when yeah. he, he published or when he was born. I I yeah. could look it up. I don't know anything about him. I mean, I've heard the name, but I'm yes. sorry to say that I don't know anything uh, about him. No. Nope. Okay, so no, no known to you, no connection between the two. I I can't remember running across any, and I don't believe okay. he's mentioned in my in good, my. Good to hear. I would recommend that book to you if you. It's Simon Winchester, the map that changed the world. Oh, I'm, I'm very uh, You know it. You know the book. I think I've seen it. I know Simon Winchester. Yeah. Yeah. Well, read it's it's exactly analogous, but in England doing uh -huh. the same thing. Okay. Uh -huh. Thank yeah. you so much. Fascinating. Sure.
when uh, the Hitchcocks traveled to Europe just once in 1850, they were, Edward was convinced they were going to end up in the bottom of the Atlantic, but they went, they spent six months and he was in the, he was up on Snowdonia in Wales and with a geologist there and looking at the glacial striae and telling that geologist, Ramsey was his name, that he thought those were formed by glaciers. And apparently that was the first Ramsey had heard of that. Now this was 1850. I don't know. Um, wow. Wow. <laughs> there you go. There's a connection. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Anybody else? I just have a question yeah. <clears throat> about your work. Um, I just wondered how many years of research you've done um, in this area. It seems like there's so much material and, and yeah. Edward Hitchcock did so much work and others right. as well. Well, it was about four years um, that I spent solely on this project. Um, I first found out about, I first realized the gap, the lack of a biography of Hitchcock when I was writing one of my novels, which is entitled Noah's Raven, and had, which is a name that was sometimes given to those bird tracks, um, and uh, which has to do with the dinosaur footprints in Western Massachusetts. And as I said, when I went looking for um, uh, the, um, uh, biography, a biography, I didn't find it. So that was about 2014. But I finished that book and another one before I started Hitchcock. And I started Hitchcock in 2017 and did almost nothing else for four years, uh, no other writing projects. Um, I was very fortunate that I, uh, nearly all of my work at Amherst College was done online because those sermons and those notes and so on, they're all been digit, nearly all been digitized. And I could sit in the comfort of my home right here and read them all. I never would have done this if it hadn't have been for the ease of accessibility of those. Um, but I did periodically go over there and look at material that was not digitized. Well, I finished up my project just about uh, the, the, my research part uh, about um, a week before COVID. And at that time, the archives at Amherst College shut and was shut for over a year. So I was just really fortunate that I finished the research part of my project um, while the archives was open and, and available. Um, and then the, the writing itself took, you know, a, a, at least a year. So yeah, four years total. Well, yeah, and I, I, I don't know why I started with a sermon of his reading a, one of those sermons online. And I remember finishing it and saying to my wife, I think I'm going to read every one of Edward Hitchcock's sermons. I know why, because I got the feeling that nobody had ever read this before. It was a handwritten manuscript. Who would have who would have been crazy enough to read that? And I and that's what I got the feeling of throughout that 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 nobody had ever published anything about most of his sermons. Um, and I had a feeling that nobody had ever read anything any of it before. So the the piece of his story that has to do with his faith and his sermons and his preaching, which I didn't talk much about tonight, um, that I think is entirely new that nobody had dealt with that before. And as far as the um, online sources, I in learning about um, about Edward Hitchcock, I did find some of the things you're talking about, and I also found it so interesting to see the artwork done by his wife and all the drawings and maps and that you can also see um, they're digitized and. Aura was phenomenal, not only as an artist and and as a scientist. I mean, she had that scientific training which served her very well in doing his illustrations. But she also had a temperament that I think was really this really saved Edward Hitchcock because she was very even tempered. She floated through life, floated over the cares and the trials and tribulations of life, whereas Edward Hitchcock was up and down all the time. She raised a bunch of what I, so far as I can tell, happy, healthy children. <laughs> Edward probably, they would have probably been all neurotic that it had been just their father's influence, but uh, she was wonderful and she was um, the perfect match for him. And I, I spent quite a bit of time in one chapter talking about how without her, he would never have accomplished. He probably would have died at the age of, you know, 40 or something without her. So yeah, and she's, and there's been quite a bit of attention given to her in recent years, uh, uh, some biographical 
biographical work of hers. Mm -hmm. uh, really, before my book was published, there was more been written about her life than about his life. Mm -hmm. uh, Bob, can I ask you one other question? Yeah. Uh, my son's an author, and I'm aware of the economics. Um, I, I'm going to our 50th reunion, and I think this would be a tremendous gift for some of my colleagues. What would be your preferred way for us to buy it? Well, I'd say if you if you have a local bookstore, just go to them and ask them to order it for you. Okay, got uh, it. Sure, if you if you do. Um, and I don't know how many of you, I bet Jenny knows about this, but there's IndieBound.org, which is an association of independent bookstores, and they have a vast uh, you know database of books, probably not as big as Amazon's, but if you. But, and all of my books are listed in IndieBound.org. And if you purchase a book through IndieBound.org, the profits go to the bookstore of your choosing. So that's a pretty uh, nice way that you can support your uh, local bookstore and nice still sit at home and as if you were ordering from Amazon or Barnes and Noble. Yeah, it was like uh, it was a nice way to say that I don't want to buy it through Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, yeah. Bob. How how uh, that was? Thanks. A really interesting talk. How how did you get interested in Edward Hitchcock initially? Um, way back when I was 10 years old, my dad, my sisters were attending UMass. And one Sunday morning in winter, when my mother was tending to my sisters at the dormitory, men were not allowed in the women's dormitories. And my dad and I went over to Amherst College and we went through what was then the, the um, uh, Pratt Museum of Natural History and hit, saw those tracks. But they were down in the basement and it was poorly lit and they were poorly exhibited. And even as a 10 year old, I thought, this is a tragedy. <laughs> and I kind of forgot about him for about 40 years until I moved to Western Massachusetts and then discovered that everybody knew the name Hitchcock, but nobody knew too much about him other than the dinosaur footprints. <laughs> um, and then I've discovered the Bineski Museum of Natural History, and that really got the creative juices flowing. So, but it does go back to when I was 10 years old. <laughs> cool. Yeah.